you, and uh, you can kick off your panel. All right, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me loud and clear? All right, I'll still use a mic because I sound better. Somebody told me that. Okay, thank you. All right, so I've been told by the person at the back that I'm not supposed to use microphone, right? Is that what you just said, sir? Okay. I can use this. That's fine. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. I know since morning everybody must have had their extra cup of coffee, maybe a pot of it. And uh, Mr. Ram Raju gave a great speech where he actually expressed how we should be breaking the status quo and doing things which have not been done before, and that's how we will bring about change. And that's what we are going to do uh, on this panel. Now, the whole idea about this panel is around big data and government. And in fact, this was interesting when Poonam said, would you be interested in moderating? I said, I'm personally living this big data challenge but at my home. <laughs> and guess what? Every morning, I get scolded for something different by my spouse. And I try to figure out if there is a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> and that requires some analytics. <laughs> and on top, I have a son who is 12 turning 13. He used to be lovey-dovey and come and hug and kiss daddy, but now suddenly he's a, you know, an arm length away at all times and he would get irate for no rhyme or reason. <laughs> Looking for that pattern as well, that what should we do at any moment of time for us to be able to get a predictable result. <laughs> so if that's what we are living in, by show of hands, how many of you live the same analytics problem? <laughs> all right. So imagine that was government. And government has, on one hand, organizations, uh, different uh, disciplines, budget has to be controlled, growth has to be brought about. How do you eat the cake and have it too? If that is what we have to achieve, that's where we should explore. And the whole idea here is not going to be a boring monologue by a few people who've been there, done that. It has to be an interactive panel where every one of you will get involved. So how many of you really want this to be an entertaining discussion? How many of you want this to be a serious discussion? OK, I like some people who have seriousness. You don't want any entertainment? Okay, it will be informative. It will come. It will be an informative discussion. So, without further ado, let me introduce the panelists. We have Honorable Dorothy Brown, who is the clerk of Cook County Circuit Court. And we had a chance to speak very briefly during some of the calls we had prior to this. And I must say, she's a person of few but very effective words whenever she uses them. Okay? I please welcome you to this session. We have Dr. Phil Shelley. Now, I mentioned about entertainment, right? You will see some of that coming from him. Watch him for that. He has that background. We have someone who has a very resilient and a very powerful personality because who has to deal with the mayor and the budget office. So Brenna Berman, who is the commissioner and CIO for the city of Chicago's Department of Innovation and Technology. I welcome her <laughs> to the podium here. Then we have someone who talks to a lot of different organizations, private, public sector, government, and tries to figure out how to satisfy their needs because they all come with their own needs and desires and wants and they want to get something for less or something for nothing in some cases. 
So Jeevan John, who is the data migration practice manager with Data Link, and he's going to bring that particular aspect of perspective to the discussion. <laughs> and here is someone who said to me that what actually should be an answer to which, what, what should be a question to which we don't have an answer yet, let's ask those questions. So tough person who's always probing to find the next best insight that's available, which people have not given. That's Laura Lane, who's the regional e team leader for partnership for Connected a little. So when I mentioned entertainment and also informative, now you satisfied, ladies? What's your name? Teresa, I'll be coming back to you with some questions as well. <laughs> so we will close all the doors. Nobody walks out because I'm going to walk to each one of you during the new course and ask them, ask you to be a panelist and ask questions and challenge all of us here so that it becomes an informative and a productive discussion. So let's do this. And I'm used to being in the broadcast business. Everything has to be time bound. And we have to have people to be not exactly on the spot, but actually think on their feet. We'll try this panel here. Starting with you, Phil, 60 seconds. And each of you will get it, so you guys have an advantage now. 60 seconds. You've got to tell that why should we even be discussing this topic and what's the relevance of that in today's world? Because we can talk about this till we turn blue, but what's the value or the outcome that you're looking for as a result of this conversation? And what you want to learn? So maybe I'll ask too many questions, but 60 seconds are enough. Okay, well, that's right. Um, I want to learn, actually. I do want to learn. Um, what, do I need this or not? Oh, yes, I think yeah, we that. should have a couple of microphones if they can be offered here. My 60 seconds burns. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you that uh, luxury. Maybe now. So um, I, I, want, I certainly want to learn what the challenges are in, uh, in gov the government sector. My background is originally healthcare and, um, and IT management in more recent years, and, and also retail in recent years too. So um, I know healthcare fairly well, but I don't know that well the other aspects of government. I do know the modern technology trends, and I hope to hopefully share with you a lot of the things that are going on in the uh, technology space, in the big data space, specifically why it relates to government, why you should be looking at those uh, tools and techniques, what you can learn from pioneers like Google and Facebook and others that have uh, created a lot of tools that we should all be using and are using in many cases, but I'm sure there's a lot of opportunities. So um, at the end of this, I hope you go away with some ideas of what's possible. Uh, some entertainment too. Some things maybe that are not possible or crazy, we can talk about those too. And there will be Macarena at some point during the <laughs> conversation. So, Dorothy, take away. I would say we have to first begin with the premise that government is for serving people. And the fact that we have been able to uh, uh, accumulate all this information, this data, we have to start to figure out how best to utilize that to predict how to better serve people. Uh, we have been uh, trying to just simply do the best we can and, and answer things really based upon what the media is doing at this moment. Uh, but it's time for us to really proactively uh, figure out how to best to use the data that we have to uh, predict the needs of people and then serve them properly. So I would say just, just simply Learning how to better serve the people, the, the key word being service. I think actually Dorothy had it right that one of the best things we can talk about today is how we are using some of these modern <coughs> technologies in partnerships with many of the people that are here today in the room um, to answer some of the most intractable challenges that the city has in the county um, and maybe explore some ways to push that even further. So I'm here for two things. First is to learn as to what is going with big data and the government, right? The second thing is to share what I know and what I do on a daily basis, which is show companies and help them how you use the, the technology. The infrastructure, the analysis that you do, the predictive analysis and things like that. What needs to be put into do that, how it's done. What you use big data for is up to your imagination. You can use it for anything and everything. There is priorities, 
there is expenses, there are things of that nature, so you prioritize things and you, you do that. So I'll share with you how we do that, how some of my customers at DataLink are actually using big data uh, for pricing, for making decisions, for making real-time things happen, and how some of those can be applied in healthcare for saving lives and pillars for protecting people's lives and things like that. So we'll share that. One of the things that I want to learn from this discussion is big data for who? I mean, it ties a little bit into what some of the other panelists said, but we have a lot of municipalities, communities, community anchor institutions who have a lot of data. So you have city level data, you have county, you have state level data, but we need small data, um, linked to big data. Um, and we have so many parts of our population who have no access and we have no intelligence on them. Just the way Dr. Raju said, we can't track them. We can't track them. There are a lot of the customers who are serviced by government and that infrastructure. And we don't know where they are. We don't know what they need. We don't know where they are in any of these trajectories that we're talking about. So we need to talk about small data. We need to talk about how we build not only the data analytics systems for a large government, but we also need to talk about data analytics for neighborhoods and systems um, very, very micro and very, very limited. All right, so we heard 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 45 seconds in terms of introductions on what they want to learn. I'll come to you, uh, Diane. Um, which organization are you with? Um, Verizon. All right, so they said they want to learn all those different flavors that you heard today. What's, what is it that you are here for? What do you think you'll walk away an installer? And, and learn about big data and how government can help. What are you expecting from government and what do you think they can ever do with the technology? I mean, government is government, right? Well, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take your time. Okay, I'll pick one. Okay, what I want to learn is um, how government's actually looking at using big data and technology, since I'm in the technology field. I need to know what I need to bring to government to help them solve their, their issues. All right. So the first question, uh, this is more to, to cut to the chase and say, government exists to serve citizens. That's the fundamental uh, role that it plays. If that's what they have to do, let's first define in what specific areas, we cannot take a broad objective, say, government is there to serve the citizens, and that's why we should use big, big data. You know, there's no connection. So if you were to start inventorying specific areas in which government has been looking to serve citizens better than before, and or if there are other agendas, take the top three, Dorothy, which ones would those be? Well, I would say in, in, in my business, uh, as the, at the uh, court system, uh, we have been looking to make the court system uh, more cost effective for the citizens. Uh, make it easier to use, easier to ma manipulate, less intimidating, so that we can, and, and also make it more accessible to, uh, this is the Supreme Court, Illinois Supreme Court has a uh, committee right now talking about access to justice, making it more accessible to all citizens so that we, ins we ensure that there is equal protection of the law for everyone. Now, that's those three things that you picked, right? Okay. Brenna, if you were to look in your world and say that these are the objectives that Dorothy says she has, is there a synchronization of objectives across multiple governments, or is there a variation, as you say? Um, I think there's a synchronization of theme. Um, the city offers different services than the county does, so we're applying things in a similar way, but to different services. So. I'm the central IT department for the city, and the mayor asks me to use analytics to improve service delivery across all of the city services, both to make them cheaper and more effective, whether it's um, how we choose to fill potholes or how the health department targets um, vaccines to the most needy in the city. We can apply analytics to all of those services to make them more efficient and effective. And the other way that we target data is to make government more transparent. Um, and you see that in the way that we are driving data into the hands of citizens to empower them to better understand government and to also use data themselves to engage in how they interact with the city. 
So we use data in, in those two ways, both internally and how we make our services more efficient and effective, and externally in sharing that data with the residents of the city to use themselves in either you know, for their own means, uh, whatever that is, whatever their own goals are, or to engage with the government and frankly hold us accountable for how we do our jobs. So it's really those two uh, directives. So Phil, now you, you take and, and wear a technology hat while being sympathetic with the government and their official challenges that they just laid out for themselves. Do you think there is a, a predictable path to nirvana <laughs> when they talk about these areas and you can say, I'm going to lay out a path. There will be a strategy, very clearly defined. There will be actionable steps, very clearly defined. There will be resources properly allocated at the right time, within the right costs, and life will be good, and we take two weeks vacation. Are there two weeks? Oh, we'll start with that. Um, well, first of all, you know, as a, as a not in the government, as a citizen, uh, and I've lived in multiple countries in my life, um, it's interesting to see how governments work differently. And uh, the difficulty in accessing data from from government just astounds me. Now, I'll give you an analogy, right? So the reason F Facebook I hold up is a good example. Right? We all we don't, we don't want to log into Facebook uh, for one thing and then another Facebook for you know just the history of another one of our friends and another Facebook for the history of another one or the photos will log in somewhere else or whatever. The, the power of a Facebook is, or a Google search, or whatever, you know, Yahoo, is that everything's in one place and visible and easy to find. That is not the case in government today, right? So I can't track my medical record. We just talked about that with Dr. Roger. I can't track my patient history across all clinics, all pharmacists, all hospitals, all my life. You look at the timeline view in Facebook. You can look at your whole timeline, right? Everybody else you want to share it with you can look at. It. It's in one place. Government is not doing that. That's why I was uh, you know, asking uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, why are we not doing that? Why are we not having a data hub that, that governments do own? It doesn't cost a fortune. These tools are very inexpensive. Why don't we have single view of us across the government or single view of anything in the government? The technology isn't the challenge. The cost isn't the challenge. The will is the challenge in my mind. We're doing it in industry all the time. So why can't you know, the consolidation of single view of whatever is happening in pri the private sector. Because that's what people want. They want security around it. They want good controls and governance and data governance. It's all about data architecture, management drive, and focus. And it's, I don't see it happening in government. I don't know why. All right. So I'm going to take the microphone and walk randomly to an individual and say, You've heard both sides. you heard the government says, I need to get certain things taken care of. And Phil says that why don't we have that, that hub, if you will, a central, one version of the truth, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let me ask, let me, let me walk up to someone. And this is Ronald. Which company are you, sir? T-Mobile. T-Mobile. So here we have both sides of the coin where someone says, why don't we have this? And they're talking strategy. You as a citizen or you as someone who is in this uh, city, for example, doing business, etc. What do you really want? Because they said, this is my strategy. I'm government official. This is my strategy or this is our strategy. And these guys are saying, uh, we need to have this this uh, utopian world of everything becoming one, which is going to take some time, I'm assuming. What do you think in the meanwhile you're losing out on? Um, that's a tough question to answer. I get paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I'm, I'm hearing very interesting trying to bridge the gap of how you know, wireless can try to meet some of these objectives. Um, I mean, that's what I would say to I'm not quite sure. Uh... OK, Laura. Brandon. OK, the thing that I would want is efficiency. The thing I would want is any time that we're trying to deal and accomplish and get something through, you know, like for instance, a new business application, or uh, you have a cafe that's trying to get a permit, it's time and efficiency that we all can benefit from. And that's the one thing that I would love to 
for using the Now, what's your name and your company? Uh, my name is Kaz. I'm with a company called Infobox. Yeah. Infobox. Okay, good. So, Laura, coming back to you, you just gave a one-word substitution for a potentially long answer, which is revenue. That's what you think a, a citizen, maybe a business person wants, but how about a citizen? Well, the citizen wants government to be efficient. And if we make it easier for the citizen to engage, um, we have a better chance of collecting the revenue. We have a better chance of collecting on the regulations that we're required to do. We have a better chance of collecting the taxes. Um, so if we can come up with an interface that makes it easier for the citizens to both access services and also pay taxes and, and do whatever other business they need to do in the city, and we do that more efficiently, it increases revenue, it increases our tax base, um, and then we can put more resources towards more innovation and attracting more innovation to the city. Brenda, can you give a proof point? Yeah, to the gentleman who just said, you know, if you make it easier to get your licenses and your permits or cafe open sooner, you read the newspaper yesterday, that's exactly what the mayor just announced. Um, the, the portal, the first round of the portal goes out by the end of this year. For future ones, it'll take two years to make that process completely paperless. It's both internal and external. So it's exactly the right thing to look for. Um, even I'd like it to be faster. We're <coughs> moving as fast as we can. Um, there are certain things that you know, would make it faster. We're always looking for those suggestions. But that is you're precisely right. You know, get the hurdles out of the way. Um, and citizens, residents, businesses can do what they want to do faster. Um, and then government can do what it wants to do, which is frankly collect revenue faster. Um, and everybody's happier. So it's exactly the right, it's exactly the right plan. So Jeevan, you, you talk to people on the business side and also quite a few government officials in order to you know, make a living, right? What is that they are saying they want to get? Because of course, Brennan's answer is that we are trying, right? We are trying real hard to get there. And of course, there is significant improvement and, and progress made. What's the holy grail? What are they after? The government. You mean the government? Yes, and their officials, because when you're saying that they want to get government to the next level and, and help the citizen, what has been defined as the holy grail which they are pursuing, because this could be an endless chase, or we could say we are satisfied, or we could have these conversations. This is a great topic when you've got no answer, but we are running very fast, but perhaps <laughs> in the wrong direction. We could spend a day. But what is it that somebody has told you that if I met this benchmark, I'm happy? So I think at the end of the day, it comes to either the vision is there, the, the desire is there with the people I talk to. So whether I talk to healthcare or government officials, the vision is definitely there. I think what is um, probably lacking is, I know Phil mentioned that the it's cheap. It's not. The investment has to be made. And uh, somebody has to draw a clear line between what I'm investing and what I'm going to gain out of that. And somebody has to take that risk and walk that line through it. Um, you see this with uh, companies like Amazon and Facebook and Google and Yahoo. And I'm, I'm throwing that out because there's clear revenue tied to that. If you look at big data analytics, last year you can see how Amazon price matched Walmart and Target in various products and you know, doubled their revenue with point percent growth in, in, in profits over the last year. There's a clear uh, you know, line al allocated with money that is coming in. Now, here's the thing. If I were to think, when I talk to the officials at government and hospitals, this is what I say. Can you see how this can actually be an investment for long term and bring in more revenues? I'll go back to what Brenna said, what Laura said about revenue collection. If I have to spend six days out of my work to go to the court to get something done, that's loss in productivity for me as an individual. Multiply that by 20 million. That's a loss for the country as a GDP overall. I am just spending. If I'm in the court, I cannot use my phone, I cannot use my iPad, I cannot even create a ruffling for my papers. I'm just sitting there doing nothing. What if a lot of that can be, and I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just saying, what if a lot of that can be automated? Will that be more taxes collected for the city? Will that be more time for the citizens to actually do work? Will that be more time for the entire economy to be more productive? Yes. I think the vision is there, but somebody has to take the risk to walk the line to make the investment. Because it is not cheap. Because here, here's what's happened. There's three things when you talk about big data. First is sensors and data collection. Five billion mo mobile devices in the world gives you geolocation, data as to what people are shopping for, what is looking for, where people are, if there's a crime rate, where, there's a lot of data collection, first thing. The second thing is how do you store that data? 
we help design a data link, massively parallel, large storage systems that can actually store this data. And that can be accessed in a very, very short time. The third thing is what Brenna was talking about is predictive analytics. You not only have to store the data, but you have to analyze the data. Those are the three things from a technical perspective that needs to be done. This is serious investment. Teraflops of CPU, terabytes of data, and lots of data scientists' time who can tweak this data to get this information out. Google can do that, Amazon can do that, Facebook can do that, because they have a clear vision as to how that will bring in revenues to the company. Who is going to make that risk? Is it the mayor? Is it Brenna? Is it the president? And yes, we are doing that. <laughs> we are taking that risk. Because then beyond when you, once you build it in the city of Chicago with investment from some grants that we've won, some partnerships with companies like Allstate and a couple of others that we're talking to, and we're doing this all open source so partners like our county can use it and other cities can use it. So we're taking the risk to actually build that sort of infrastructure because we have that size of data and we think the value is worth it. Um, and not a lot, but not a lot of cities, to your point, not a lot of cities and nonprofits actually have that wherewithal, right? Chicago is a big city. New York can also do this, and we're about it. So we build it open source so other cities can then take what we did. But then once you build it, I then have 30 some odd departments that have to use it. And they don't work this way, right? So then I actually have to go out to every department who works pretty efficiently now. I don't want anybody to walk out of here thinking that the city of Chicago isn't trying their hardest sort of in their standard operating way to be efficient and effective, but then I go to them and say, okay, you have the way that you've op operated for the last decades, and now I want to change the way you operate, and they're not going to do it just because I tell them to, right? They're going to do it because we run experiments and trials and show them results, and this takes time. So then we go through an implementation phase. Right? And the county does the same thing when they try new things. They don't just throw it out there. They need results to prove that they do it. And it's results that show efficiency and effectiveness and improve customer service. So it doesn't happen overnight. And so do we all wish this could be faster? Sure. But you're one, we all do this with our taxpayer dollars. So we're careful 